I'm Mark Mobley, the co-director of the Arts Career and Entrepreneur arts career and entrepreneurship space and i'm thrilled to welcome to common hour the newly minted dr eric elmgren alumnus of the university of georgia hugh hodgson school of music now located in colorado who's going to talk to us about creative place making so take it away eric Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, it's really great to be here with all of you. Uh, as he said, I'm actually a, a recent alumnus of the University of Georgia. And so it's wonderful to be back, even if it's visual, uh, virtually. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today a little bit about the path that I got started on uh, while at the University of Georgia. And so I do have a presentation that I'm going to share with you guys. But before I dive into that, I want this to be a little bit more uh, discussion based than just me talking at you for 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and so I'm going to ask a question fairly early on in the presentation. And if possible, I would love to hear some responses. You guys can just type them in the chat um, and I'll be sure to be reading them and we can talk about them a little bit before I uh, go ahead and answer the question myself. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right, that's showing up for everybody. Okay, so yeah, as Mark mentioned, I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about uh, the field that I got really interested in while at the University of Georgia, which was creative placemaking. And I'm gonna share a little bit about how I kind of ended up there first before uh, getting into the, the meat of the presentation. So like a lot of you, I, discovered kind of in high school that I wanted to be a musician full time for my career, I had picked up playing saxophone in the fifth grade. And that led to me getting a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in saxophone performance with the intent on teaching in higher education. And what ended up happening is at the end of that master's degree, I ran into what I've been calling a textbook case of burnout, something I'm sure a lot of you guys are feeling or have felt before. And I started to ask the question of, well, what was all of the work that I was doing in the practice room and rehearsals and performances and in the classroom? Why did that matter and how did that relate to the world around me? Um, it felt very insular and I was looking for an answer to that question of kind of what was the meaning of what I was doing. And mostly by luck, more than anything else, I stumbled onto the field of creative placemaking or community engaged music making. And also luckily at the same time, started the doctorate at the University of Georgia, where I found that a lot of professors and fellow students were also interested in the same thing. And not only were they interested in it, but they were actively encouraging me to pursue it. And so that became my doctoral dissertation. I wrote a very long paper about how creative placemaking fits into higher education, specifically in studying music. And so I defined creative placemaking as the strategic reimagining of the boundaries around arts, culture, and education, so that they become essential parts of work in community development and social activism. Since that time, I graduated in May, uh, like Mark said, uh, the world has changed, right? The pandemic has happened, so much is, so much is going on. And I ended up moving across the country to Colorado. Sorry, my dog wants to get behind my chair, go on. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so in, in moving across the country, I, one, had to come to grips with what it means to be a musician and a scholar and a performer and teacher outside of academia for the first time in my life, uh, which has been a really interesting but engaging challenge uh, to come to grips with. And also, I realized that the research that I started at UGA wasn't done. It needed to keep going. And so I wanted to look both with more breadth and depth in terms of where to, to continue the research and what, what about it was really interesting to me. And so what I arrived at with this new, was this new question that has sort of consumed my artistic work for the past six months or so. And so that question is, oh, going forward.
right? Technical difficulties. Here we go. All right, so here's the question. What is the role of artists in our communities? And so, like I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, before I dive into the answer that I've started to come up with, which I don't believe is the only right answer or even the right answer to this question, I wanted to actually get some input from you guys. What are you feeling um, either over the past year, today, um, about what role do artists have to play? And if you could just type that in the chat, I'd love to read a little bit about where your guys' heads are at before I really dig into uh, my response. bringing music to the general public. Thanks, Sarah. Any other thoughts? To provide release and to bridge the gap between different divided people. Thanks, Joe. Make us feel something, a shared humanity. Thanks, Connie. Build community, unifying community. There we go. Now we're getting the creative juices flowing. Bring about social change. Thanks, Grace. Increasing the quality of people's lives through access to art. Thanks, Lindsay. It was really great to read all of these. Um, and I wanted to, to ask that question and get you guys thinking about it first, because it's something that's gonna take real intentional thought on our behalf as artists. And the, the sooner we start thinking about it and having a conversation about it, the sooner maybe we can start making the change that we want to happen. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump back into that presentation, start sharing my screen again. Um, and continue to post these down below. I'll try and catch and uh, stop in with them as much as I can. But I just want that thought to be per percolating in our heads uh, during this presentation is what role do artists play in our society, in our communities? So when I started digging into this question, the natural starting point for me occurred to be, well, what are our communities? What are they like right now? Um, and this is, can encompass communities all around the world, but I'm gonna be focusing a little bit on the United States just because that's the community that we live in and using some data to talk about what, what's going on in our communities right now. So over the past 50 years or so, we have become more divided and separate than ever before. We have geographically, politically, and even spiritually sorted ourselves into like-minded groups. To put this as simply as I can, it means that more Americans live near, work amongst, and interact with people who think exactly like them than they do with people who think differently. Now, this has had a really tangible effect on our society in a way that I want to share a quote with you that I think illuminates this. And this quote comes from a book called The Big Sort by Bill Bishop. And it was written in 2009 when he presented all of this data. So what he has to say here has become only more pronounced in the, in the most recent 11 years. And so he says that we all live with the results of this sorting. Balkanized communities whose inhabitants find other Americans to be culturally incomprehensible a growing intolerance for political differences that has made national consensus impossible, and politics so polarized that Congress is stymied and elections are no longer just contests over policies, but bitter choices between ways of life. And the data supports this. If we look at 1976, and this is gonna feel really topical, I know we're in the middle of a presidential election right now, 
But if we look at the presidential election from 1976, about 25% or a little bit less of counties in the United States were decided by a landslide for one candidate or another. We obviously don't have data from yesterday or this week yet, but if we look at the most recent one in 2016, that number goes up to 80%. 80% of counties in the United States were a landslide for one candidate or another. Again, we don't live or work amongst people now who think really any differently from us. And that's different than how it used to be. And so what's interesting about this is you would think with all of this sorting that we do and belonging to a group of people, or at least amongst a group of people that are like us, we would feel less lonely. But it's actually the reverse. So if we take those same years, 1980, so 1976 or 1980, there was a survey done in the country where they asked people to say if they were lonely or not. And about 20% of respondents or 20% of the country that was sampled reported feeling lonely. If we go to 2017, that number is over 40% now. And you may be wondering that why does loneliness matter? Well, human beings are social by nature. We are biologically wired for connection with each other. And there was a study done called Loneliness and Social Isolation as Risk Factors for Mortality by Julianne Holt Lundstad, Timothy B. Smith, and J. Bradley Layton, where they looked at medical issues and uh, states of being, how those would impact people's chances of potentially dying young. And they presented a bunch of different figures. So I'll share a few of them with you now. If we live with air pollution, our chance of dying young goes up about 5%. If we're living with obesity, that chance goes up to about 20%. Excessive drinking or smoking, that number is about 30%. If we live with loneliness, that number goes up to 45%. And that number floored me the first time I read it. Just the idea of being lonely can actually physically affect us in such a tangible way. And it's because of the way that we biologically are built. We need to be in connection with other people. And not only is this connection with other people important for our, our health, it's also important for our sense of self. And so I'm going to share a quote with you from A Hidden Wholeness, The Journey Towards an Undivided Life by author Parker Palmer, where she says, a strong community helps people develop a sense of true self. For only in community can the self exercise and fulfill its nature. Giving and taking, listening and speaking, being and doing. But when community unravels and we lose touch with one another, the self atrophies and we lose touch with ourselves as well. And I know I'm speaking for myself here and I imagine other people probably feel the same, but since March, since the pandemic started, I miss the part of myself that I see reflected in interactions with other people, with my friends, with my families, with my colleagues. And there's this idea of other people are mirrors for us to see ourselves in them. And more than ever, we're missing that right now. So not only are we lonely because we are not interacting with other people in a way that is really meaningful, but we also are lonely uh, in ourselves. We're isolating ourselves uh, because of this the sorting and all of the other things that are beyond our control right now too, in terms of the pandemic. Sorry, it's not responding again. Okay. So you may be wondering now, well, why music? What does that have to do with loneliness and uh, separation that we're feeling right now in our communities? Well, just like humans are biologically wired for connection, we are biologically wired to respond to sound and music. Um, it can change our behavior. It can change our brain function. It can even change our body chemistry. And we can leverage that power of sound and the power of music specifically in order to create the space for the connection that we so desperately need. There is this uh, study that was done in the 60s by researcher Andrew Neher, where he talked about the uh, process called entrainment, where human beings align themselves to the visual and aural rhythms of the world in our brains. Our brainwave frequencies actually begin to match. A good example of this would be if you've ever gone to a nightclub or if you just think about a scene from a movie from a nightclub. 
where people begin to move in sync with the music, with the rhythm, with the flashing of the lights. And that doesn't necessarily an intentional process. People don't get together and say, okay, we're going to go all dance together at 72 beats per minute. It just happens naturally because that's the way our bodies work. And there's lots of examples of this uh, throughout history. If we think about the way music is used on the battlefield, for example, to give orders, to inspire confidence and commands, uh, music is used to control behavior that way. It's also used in social protest movements and brings people together around uh, causes in a, a tremendously powerful way. There are thousands of references to shamans in ancient texts using music for healing purposes. And those practices have really persisted to this day. We just call them something different. We call them music therapy. And if you even think necessarily outside of music, although maybe John Cage would beg, beg to differ with us about uh, what music sounds like, but think about the way that we use sound in medical treatments. So we can use ultrasounds, which sonic waves to see inside the body. We use sound waves to break up cataracts or treat tendinitis or even to fight cancer. And so we have a really powerful tool at our disposal as musicians in order to influence behavior, but more, more than that is to create space for authentic connection. So here's my answer to that question. And again, I'm not proposing this as the only right answer. I don't think there is only one right answer, but this is an answer that I've found tremendous resonance with over the past six months. The role of artists in our society is to stand in the gap of social, ideological, and cultural differences and reaffirm our connection to our shared humanity. So how do we meet this role? Well, there's a few things that we can do. One, we have to cultivate an artistic practice grounded in trust. And this is trust both in ourselves and also between performers and teachers and the participants in their artistic experiences. And I use the word participant here very deliberately. Over the past year or so, I've actually been trending away from the term audience. Because to me, that implies almost a, a passiveness to the experience where you are there to just listen and receive something rather than becoming actively involved in the experience, bringing yourself into that artistic experience so you can connect with everyone else in that space. And again, this, this trust is it's, it's both ways. It's both trust in ourselves and it's interpersonal trust. We also have to co-create artistic experiences with input from our community. We have to invite them to the table of the creative process and expect their participation. And every element of a musical or artistic experience can be changed or adapted to create space for dialogue and authentic human connection. In my book here, no tradition is sacred. Um, so participant performer arrangements and behavior expectations, like how do we expect people to dress? What do we expect people to pay? Can they use their phones or get up and dance or clap or... All of that stuff is on the table here because what we're focused on is the way that we can create the most authentic connection between everybody in the room. And even the room itself, the choice of venue, is a lever that can be worked. How we speak in performance or deliver program notes is especially important. If we deliver program notes from an academic perspective where we give people guideposts to listen to and say, you'll hear these things in this piece so you can follow it, their metrics for success in that experience becomes if they heard the guideposts, not if they actually fully invested of themselves in that performance. The availability of food and drink, we do this at popular music concerts, why don't we do this at classical music concerts? Um, and there's so many more things that we could do. So to, to really dig into what this meeting this role looks like, I wanna share again two quotes with you, I'm gonna break them apart. So the first one, is by an uh, author and choreographer named Liz Lerman. And she says, shed the veneer of being the only presenter in the room just because of the assumption that we are there to convene the space. What if we shifted the context to allow the audience to become the performer, to decide and embody their music so that we might become the listener? 
what would it look like for us to go into a concert or an artistic setting that we set up, that we invite people to, and decide that we are going to listen louder than we play? How does that change the experience? And then the second one comes from Alan Lomax. And he says, arts produced by diverse groups of people are socially valuable because they offer ideas, technologies, and values that help us figure out how to live together. The real benefit of vital, equitable culture lies well beyond the money there is to be made. It offers us a sense of individual worth, bolsters our collective adaptability, and forms the foundation for social progress. In that sense, cultural diversity is like biodiversity. At its best, it functions like a creative ecosystem. The final product of culture is not a commodity, it is society. And I want to highlight two things in this quote. Once they come up. Come on. So first, diverse groups of people, vital, equitable culture. There's a big movement right now in this country to lean into equity and inclusion. And this is extraordinarily important in the arts. We need to celebrate the voices of everyone, even those on the margins, and bring them into the creative process, both in terms of making the art and being a part of the performances, a part as participants or performers. And telling everyone's story is so important to creating the kind of connection that we so desperately need. And then also this idea of letting go of the idea of art as a commodity, as something that we can buy and sell and trade in transactional relationships. That doesn't lead to real authentic relationships between people. But instead, if we think about it as part of the fabric of our society, as part of our culture, as a key vehicle for driving our relationships with each other, suddenly we can actually leverage this power of sound and music to create the spaces that we need right now. And so in, in order to pursue stepping into that role, I wanna talk specifically, narrow the focus here about a path for higher ed, or I would even say a challenge for higher ed. Um, and this is definitely putting on the hat that I put on during my research, where I specifically talked about how creative placemaking and higher education intersect. So first of all, we need to think critically about the role of artists in our communities, and we have to place it prominently throughout the curriculum. So this means in the classroom, this means in the rehearsal room, this means in the practice room, this means in the lesson studios. It needs to be in as many places as possible because it should be a fundamental part of our artistic practice. We have to highlight and focus on equity and inclusion. We need to broaden the history and the styles of music supported by our curriculum so that they include everyone every voice. We have to use our resources to highlight the unique culture and artistry of our own communities in which our universities live and get students and faculty involved via teaching, performing, and learning. The most important part here is not about presenting a pristine work of art. It's just about showing up. That first step is the most important part. If we just show up to the room and even if we don't have an agenda, that magic of connection through art can happen. And we need to make an invitation to the table for community members to participate in the creative process. They help plan the events, they help write the music, they inform who shows up. And we should expect intentional participation from them. And when we do expect intentional participation, we should encourage and even welcome dissent. Now this won't be without challenges. Uh, higher education definitely has some things that are ingrained right now that are counter in lots of ways to this model. And the only way that we can really address those uh, challenges is through systems changes. I'm going to talk about just a few of those really quickly here. Number one, ownership of artistic work in higher education is really important. In order for me to graduate, I had to own my dissertation. For composers, you have to own the music that you write. Um, we have to own the performance spaces. And that oftentimes runs counter 
to the communal ownership model that we find in creative placemaking or in community engaged music making. If we want to really step into this role and bring people together uh, for healing and transformation, then we need to think about ownership a little bit differently. There's also misaligned timelines between the cadence of higher education and this kind of work. In higher education, we think in two to four year increments, right? Students are there for two to four years, faculty sometimes there for longer, but oftentimes creative placemaking projects or really deep community engaged music organizations think in terms of decades. And likewise, student and faculty populations at universities are transient. Students graduate and move on to new schools or new jobs. Faculty sometimes leave for other positions. And so if we're gonna do this right, it means that we have to integrate the institution with the community so that we can navigate some of that transience. Come on. Next, we have a lack of time and energy on the behalf of students and faculty after completing their job and curriculum requirements. Uh, it's not uncommon for a, a undergraduate school of music student, and I know this because I was one and I saw this with many of the students I worked with at UGA, for you guys to get up and be at school at 7 a.m. and your day's not done until 11 p.m. Where in that time frame do, do we have the space for this kind of work, which is often very time consuming and very taxing? Um, building those relationships with community take time and intent. And if we don't have that time uh, in our curriculum or in our course of study, it, it becomes very difficult to fit in. And so perhaps we need to loosen up those restrictions or figure out new solutions um, to this problem. This will be coming up in a second. Sorry that it's being a little bit slow, but this goes along with uh, the misalignment with traditional faculty incentives, such as promotion and tenure. The activities that typically reward those things, such as presenting at conferences, writing and publishing, uh, premiering new works, doing research, a lot of those things were encountered to the kind of activities that normally go into this role of an artist in the community. And so perhaps we need to reevaluate too how we think about uh, faculty incentives. And finally, developing trust between universities and the communities they inhabit. Uh, it's no secret that many universities struggle with what's called a town and gown problem. UGA is no uh, exception here. There's definitely a bit of a, a social and a cultural divide between the University of Georgia and Athens. And there's definitely work being done to bridge that. But lots of times communities that have large research one institutions associated with them can feel a bit like a laboratory or guinea pigs for the work of the university. And we need to make sure that we are very careful when we step into this work, that we're doing it in a way that promotes trust. And to speak a little bit about trust, or well, to not speak about it actually, um, I could spend an hour talking about what trust means in artistic practice and in musical settings. And I don't have enough time in just this presentation to talk about it today, I wanted to speak in broad strokes with you all so we can get the conversation started. But if you're interested in learning a little bit more about trust in artistic practice and musical settings, I would encourage you to go to my website, ericelmgren.com, where I'm writing a long series of blog posts that break apart what trust really means in artistic practice. Um, and so finally, the last challenge, and this is really the big one for us, my challenge to higher ed, that is, is that we have the opportunity or maybe even the responsibility to work with community members to envision a future through artistic experience. And when we vision that future, we then have the ability to live into that future. And so I want to close uh, with one more quote. And this one, I think, sums it all up for me and speaks to the charge that we have going forward. Um, whether that you say that that start point was this year, 10 years ago, today, um, our charge is really as artists to step into this place where we can be healers, transformers, restorers for our communities. We can rehumanize ourselves so that we can find the connection that we so desperately need. 
And so this quote comes from Brene Brown. She's a noted research professor, social worker, uh, and best-selling author. She works at the University of Houston. And in her book, Braving the Wilderness, she says this, and it'll come up in a second, I promise. Art has the power to render sorrow beautiful, make loneliness a shared experience, and transform despair into hope. Music, like all art, gives pain and our most wrenching emotions voice, language, and form, so it can be recognized and shared. The magic of music is the magic of all art, the ability to both capture our pain and deliver us from it at the same time. All right. So at this point, I actually want to stop talking so much uh, and hear what people have to say and just open up this, this space to be a place where we can have a discussion about what the role of artists are in our communities and how potentially we can be that uh, thing that stands in the gap and provides healing and restoration for all of us. Thank you. There's some more comments in the chat that have, that have rolled in as you were talking. Okay. Michael says, I think musicians can have many roles and they can choose to engage with some or all of them. Art and culture can always be a platform to advocate for justice and social change, as well as to provide nuance to articulation of oppression. They also have the role of continuing the life of their craft. <laughs> it's okay that you can't answer this shortly, Michael. This question is really, really open-ended, and I think the only answers are long ones. Um, in trying to, to put together this presentation, I had to cut so much stuff that I thought was gonna be valuable just to keep it again in broad strokes and to make sure that there was room for discussion. And honestly, that's sort of the beauty of it too, is that this answer is something that we co-create. We create it together. It's not just one person coming up with the right answer. Um, and so there's, there's power in numbers here um, and in unified intent. Gregory, provide the language that unifies communities and culture. Yes. Artists should endeavor to create joy everywhere and everyone with everyone you can for all time. Uh -huh. So Eric, yeah, can you yeah, give an example, you, can you give an ex a concrete example of the type of project that emerges when you're doing placemaking? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, so these look very, very different depending on the community that you're involved in. I think that's like the first part that's most important to convey is there's no one size fits all approach here. Um, it really depends on who we are trying to reach and what kinds of connections we are trying to build. Um, so I'll give two examples. I'll use a, a national example first and then I will use a UGA example second. Um, so a national example could be the Messiah Project, which is run by an organization called Street Symphony, which is based in LA. Um, and every December, they put together a community production of Handel's The Messiah, where there's a mix of professional musicians and members of Los Angeles' Skid Row community, which is the largest population of homeless people in the world. Um, and they all come together for this moment of common joy to, to sing the Messiah. And then they also feature works and spoken word that are by people living in Skid Row that provide them a voice. And the idea being that through a project like this, we are connecting people that might otherwise not normally connect. But two, and this is the more important part, is that every single person deserves the chance to have their voice heard and to access creative life because we are creative beings. And I'll, I'll speak, uh, I'll drop this in here too. This is one thing I wanted to, to speak about in the presentation, but I wasn't sure if I was gonna have time. There's a really great project out there called the Unlonely Project, which is being run by the Foundation for Art and Healing. And one of the things they talk about is that one of the ways that human beings actually counteract loneliness is through transcendent experiences. And these can be things like being in nature 
or witnessing great art. And our first uh, instinct as human beings, and this is scientifically proven, upon encountering a transcendent experience, our first instinct is to want to seek generosity and connection. When we experience something like that, our first instinct is to share it with someone else. Um, and so a project like the, the Messiah Project actually tries to accomplish that. For a UGA example, I would reference the project that probably some of you have seen that was done a couple years ago um, called Charlottesville. That was a, a piece written by Timothy Adams, the professor of percussion there, and performed by him and Dr. Turner and Dr. Frigo. And the part that is really interesting about this uh, project was the first performance, which was in, I believe I'm getting the date right here, August of 2018. It was a year after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. And they brought together a diverse, equitable, inclusive group of engaged citizens from Athens to hear the work for the first time and then offer feedback and discussion about it, perhaps like where it should be played, who it should be played for, and just get honest responses to a particularly challenging piece of music. Not challenging in terms of, I mean, I'm sure it is a challenging piece to play, but challenging in its subject material and what it talks about and what it asks us to do as an audience member. Um, and so engaging the audience in that way uh, is, is, is a method for for building that connection, building the relationships that we need to really conquer this loneliness problem that we're running into. And also get us to the point where we can have honest discussions with each other, regardless of our differences and still recognize our humanity. Um, one of the most common trends that we're witnessing right now is this idea of dehumanizing people. And oftentimes that occurs through images and words first, um, and then can continue to, to, go, to go farther than that. And when we dehumanize groups of people, we are, are separating ourselves from a real sense of accountability for our, 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 common, um, our common goals, our common dreams, our common needs. And so art can leverage those same, same things, uh, words and music and images. The same things that are used to dehumanize people can also be used to rehumanize people. And that's part of our challenge. So we will take questions. If you have any questions, put them in the chat and we can make you uh, temporarily a panelist and you can ask them via video. In the Q&A. So an anonymous attendee asks, what models are you exploring for engaging with participants slash communities that seem to stand in total opposition to the humanity you or your art represents or the truth you must maintain with artistic integrity? How do you humanize those who dehumanize? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I've been seeing a lot of, um, and there's a lot of discussion about this right now, um, about like cancel culture or how do we, how do we interact with people who just fundamentally disagree with us? And it's, it's come to the point where it's like culturally incomprehensible, like I said earlier in this presentation. And that is a really, really challenging space to stand. And so I don't wanna, I don't wanna approach my answer to this question as like, I have an answer because I don't think that I do yet. Um, but what I will say is that there's a tremendous amount of power in the following statement. And this is potentially a very, very vulnerable place to go. Um, but when you come into a, a situation like that, where you feel like they're not speaking to your truth or it's, it's challenging your beliefs, our first instinct is gonna be wanna push back. But what if we actually said, I hear what you're saying, tell me more. That's a really, really brave space to go. Um, but if we can, in, in an attempt to, to rehumanize them as well, because we are just as much victims of dehumanizing as they might be, um, we want to set up a conversation where, where we can both speak our truth to each other and maybe there's some common ground there. The idea of you're either with me or against me is a false dichotomy. 
that's set up by the people throwing down the gauntlet saying saying that um and there's almost always a solution in there it's just really really challenging to find um but if we go against our gut instinct and we actually try to listen a little bit perhaps that'll open up the space and allow us to have that really really hard conversation and in that hard conversation whether that's through art or through words or, or what have you we need to set up some parameters on that relationship. We need to agree on the intent of um, what we're doing and hold each other accountable to that intent. And so if we set up that agreement, we can say, you know, hey, you're pushing into an area that's dehumanizing me right now, or, you know, we don't agree on this. And hopefully we, we can find some agreement there. I know that's probably not the best answer to the question, um, but it's, you, you asked the million dollar question right there. It's the one that like, I'm, I've been thinking about a lot over the past couple of weeks is like, now that I'm starting to clarify this part and I'm finding a lot of resonance here, how do I push, um, into those spaces where it feels like there's just tremendous resistance. So we may have a question from Joe Himmelberg. Let's get him on. Hey, Eric. Good to see you. Hey, again. Joe. Good to see you, too. Um, my question was about um, current circumstances and how they've impacted your pursuit of um, creative placemaking. Sure. Um, I was just kind of wondering how things like uh, coronavirus or um, racial political tensions like that impact the ways in which your attempts to connect are received. Um, and I'm wondering how when you're trying to um, connect with a community that might be a little tough to connect with for whatever reason, um, valid or invalid um how you can you can attempt to mitigate that yeah i mean it's a good question i'll speak first to coronavirus um first of all it's really really hard um i was fully prepared at the uh, you know when graduating that i was going to continue to do this work um and it's just not possible right now we can't get in the same room and there are ways to get around that but there is no replacement for being in the same room with groups of people. Um, there's just an energy that we feel. And I'm sure that everybody in this room has felt that before, whether it's a particularly moving piece of music in a concert or go attending a sporting event, go dogs, um, where you feel this connection to other people that you can't explain. And that's really, really hard to simulate in a Zoom call or um, in something remote. But again, if we set up that space and we dig into what it means to feel trust in that space and to bring ourselves honestly into that space, we can find some of that connection. I found it a couple of times over the past, since March, um, but it takes time and deliberate intent to set that up. So it's a lot more difficult than just getting everybody in the room, although that's challenging in and of itself. In terms of like political or racial tensions and, and feeling resistance to that, that's also very, very difficult. Um, and I think the, the answer that I gave to the question before about like you have to be willing to listen in those spaces is, is that first, first key step. And once you've established that mutual trust, even if it feels really uncomfortable to do so, like we can lean into that uncomfortableness. Um, there's another Brene Brown quote that says that vulnerability isn't a weakness. It's actually the bravest place you will ever stand. Um, and doing the work that we do and trying to connect in that way and inhabiting this role, standing in the gap um, of these differences is going to be a vulnerable place to stand. You're going to be alone while you're standing there. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because um, the only way that we really find true belonging is we have to belong to ourselves just as much as we belong to other people. Um, and so if you feel resistance, if you feel vulnerable, you're probably going in the right direction. Lean into that. <laughs> um, and it's a scary thing to do, um, but it's amazing what happens when we do it. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the question, Joe. So Eric, what are some of the specific curricular changes you would recommend? I mean, you know, UJ is mm -hmm. thinking about, the music school is thinking about how it evolves sure. its next generation curriculum when there's so much um you know in, in any music school the curriculum is packed 
Yes. You know, there's there's a lot of theory you have to get through. There's a lot of music history. There's a lot of um, things that are required. Sure. So do you envision changing how traditional topics are taught or entirely new classes and ways of teaching to foster creative placemaking? Sure. Uh, to be honest, I think it's a mix of both. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to a couple of different things. I, I highlighted the need for equity and inclusion, and I know this is something that UGA is actively pursuing, and that can be you know, funneled into lots of different areas of the curriculum, whether it's the music that's studied in music history. Um, we study 20 pieces by Bach in theory, which is great, and we learned four-part uh, you know, voice leading and harmony and stuff like that, but what if we only did five? And then we also dug into music from West Africa and jazz and blues and even like American popular music. Um, but then also creating new experiences. So perhaps the idea of, you know, large ensembles at the University of Georgia give numerous performances in Hodgson Hall every year. What if some of those were moved out into the community um, and perhaps done with community input? Um, and so again, to, to reiterate what I said before, I don't think that there's any tradition here that's really sacred. And maybe that's kind of a I don't know, a blasphemous thing to say. Um, but there's many levers that we can work that we aren't working right now. And so in addition to creating new curriculum, but also adjusting the old one, I think that there's, there's some really concrete things that we can do to make sure that at its core, the value that we're promoting is not necessarily um, pumping out art as a commodity, like I said, but it's the idea of what are the things that go around our craft that are required to give us sort of the courage we need to step into this space. Um, and a little bit of courage and a little bit of craft can go a long way. So it sounds like you're advocating, in terms of performers at least, uh, you want a more complete performer. You want a performer who can communicate verbally as well as musically. Right. And, and be an advocate for the music mm -hmm. in, in ways that somehow, you know, maybe instrumentalists and singers have not been taught in the past. Yeah, and I think it's this idea of the, the holistic artist. Um, oftentimes, and I know I felt this way through a lot of my education. As I come out, I came out of it knowing how to play the saxophone really well. But there are some things along these lines in terms of like, if I stepped into a for example, in, in January and February before the pandemic happened, I was teaching a music technology class over at um, Coyle Middle School in Athens. And it was primarily working with um, students of color, um, like young middle school students, primarily Hispanic and, um, and black. And it took me a while to get comfortable with that. And that is not something that my saxophone education ever prepared me for. And it wasn't that I was uncomfortable interacting with them. It was just, I didn't know their story. And that was really, I, I remember having the thought of like, I've been going to school for 28 years and I don't know this incredibly important story. Um, and so I think cultivating that interest, cultivating that, that sense of responsibility to be complete artists. Um, and that means wearing the performer hat sometimes. It means wearing the teacher hat sometimes. It means wearing the uh, communicator, mediator, and therapist hat sometimes. Um, and so there are a lot of extra musical skills that go beyond just like being able to play and teach well um, that can help us discover perhaps a more integrated and uh, valuable path for artists going forward. Um, we talk all the time in art circles about how there's not enough money provided for the arts and nobody seems to value the arts anymore. Well, even if that's the world we inherited, we have the ability to be the authors of our own experience in that space and we can create the value for our art that we know exists um even if there are there are challenges so we're almost at time but we have time for some more questions yeah if there are any out there or comments you could put there's one in the q a an anonymous attendee asks, outside of the formal education system at any level, what are other ways a young artist can develop their artistry, humanity, connection to community? It's a great question. Um, so I think that 
one of the things is just a, a, a sense of curiosity, right? There's a, uh, an idea of education being a, a transaction. We are a vessel that is filled by education. Um, what if we actually thought about education as teaching other people how to learn? And so that's a process that you can take anywhere, even outside of a formal education system. Um, but getting involved in your community in whatever way seems valuable to you. There are, if we're thinking about Athens specifically, there is an, an inordinate amount of nonprofit organizations in Athens, way more than most towns of its size. Um, and if you, so if you have a particular interest in a social issue or a particular group of people, there is a nonprofit organization that is actively looking for volunteers. Um, and just getting involved with people that are different from us, I think different from your experience, that have a story that needs to be heard that you haven't heard before. Um, and that's, that's probably one of the most valuable ways is just actually being with people and showing up to the space. And when you show up to that space, you learn what are the sorts of things that create that magic, that connection that really happens, whether that's through art or, or through something else. Um, and then you can take that experience and try to say, okay, well, how does this musical project that I'm, that I'm working on, how do I apply it to that feeling? What sorts of things can I target? Um, to, to really do that. And then it's just trial and error. Um, and I guess I mean, I've said it a bunch of times already, but the most important thing is that first step, you just have to show up. Um, and so I, by the time I was leaving Athens, I was trying as much as possible, as much as the pandemic would allow to kind of plug myself in to all of those different avenues. Um, when I was at the School of Music uh, at Georgia, I also left the School of Music to go get a graduate certificate in nonprofit management through the School of Social Work. And I interacted with completely different people with completely different priorities um, that I never would have gotten if I just stayed isolated to my, my little bubble. Um, and so I think there's, there's really some strong activities that, that can go into us that perhaps teach us even more than a formal education might. Um, but it's about cultivating that interest, cultivating that courage to step outside our comfort zone and be vulnerable and um, actively learn from other people. That is fantastic. These are all goals we should aspire to. What's next for you? So for me, what's next? Um, like I said, I, I moved uh, at the end of the summer out here to Colorado. Um, it became very clear in July that the traditional path that I'd kind of set myself out on, which was to get a teaching position in higher education, wasn't going to happen this year. And my wife is an orchestral flute player. The orchestra that she was a part of canceled their season outright. No auditions are happening. So we decided to just move somewhere that we wanted to move. Um, so we're now living in the mountains of Colorado and being inspired by the nature all around us. Um, and actively pursuing an uh, act, artistic practice outside of academia, at least for me for the time being which has been an interesting challenge. Um, but the big kind of artistic projects that I'm working on right now, in addition to looking for jobs when they start to come back, is that website and the blog that I'm writing, which will probably eventually turn into, in combination with the dissertation, some kind of book that I'm hoping to pitch at some point. Um, so I'm actively writing about taking really deep dives on this topic and things that are connected to this topic, like trust, for example. I'm reading a lot and then uh, the quartet that I'm a part of, the Fuego Quartet, we are still actively trying to, to concertize and um, do projects virtually, um, including one that will be happening this Friday, actually, at the GMTA conference. Um, we are premiering a piece written by Dr. Lane. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're really excited about that. And I'm sure if you are in Dr. Lane's studio, he's asked you to go and check it out. <laughs> so that's kind of what, what I've been up to for, for the, uh, right now and probably for the next year or so. And we'll see kind of how, how the world settles after this. Um, but really leaning into that right now, and today is a particularly relevant day to discuss this, we have a challenge as artists to become healers, to become transformers, to become restorers. And so I'm just trying to envision what that looks like and then live into that. Thanks. Well, thank you for your suggestions for how we can all do that. Thank this, you. Has been, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of you who attended. And that concludes our common hour. Thank you, sir.
Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be with you all. Yeah, great to talk. And the thank yous are rolling in in the chat. Yes, thank you all. Thanks, everybody. And Eric, I'll be in touch with you. OK, thanks so much, Mark. Thank you. Emily and Lisa, did you have anything? I was just kind of waiting for everyone to like, you know, fade out. Because I can't actually uh, turn, you know, the, this meeting offline. So now everyone's still looking at us. Oh, you, we can just manually, uh, if, if that's okay, I'm just gonna manually remove some, some people who might have stepped away. Uh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's just us again. Yay, Yay that was go. great, Eric. I that's think I heard a Similar version of uh, this talk at the uh, CSW thing that you did. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely similar to that. It's 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 grown out of mm -hmm. that. I think that what's been most rewarding about leaving academia and finishing the dissertation for the first time is the opportunity to just go in whatever direction I want. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were a lot of these threads were things that came up for me when I was writing the oh. dissertation. But